Amen. Well, if you would turn, please turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And while you're turning there, let me tell you what a joy it is for me to be here at Trinity. I have such admiration and affection for your president, for your faculty, uh, for many of your, your students that I've come to know. And, and it's really a joy and a privilege to be here today. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I'd like for us to start reading with verse 1 and read all the way down to verse 22. And since these words are breathed out by the Holy Spirit and come with the authority of Jesus himself, would you please join me in standing out of reverence for the word of our God? The Holy Spirit says, As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And when all of the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. King Solomon offered as a sacrifice 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. The priests stood at their posts, and the Levites also with the instruments for music to the Lord that King David had made for giving thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Whenever David offered praises by their ministry opposite them, the priests sounded trumpets, and all Israel stood. And Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered the burnt offering and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that Solomon had made could not hold the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days, and all Israel with him in a very great assembly from Lebohamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly, for they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for the prosperity that the Lord had granted to David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Thus, Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that Solomon planned to do in the house of the Lord in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you, and this house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, Everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster upon them. May God bless his word to us this morning. You may be seated. I came really close one time to being excommunicated. Not from a church, but from the Cub Scouts. I was, I suppose, seven or eight years old, and we were in Cub Scouts working on uh, what was called a God and Country badge. 
And the way that we worked on that badge was that we went to a Methodist church just a few miles away from my house where we would meet with the pastor there and he would talk to us about what it means to be good citizens and what it means to, uh, to obey and to serve God. And then we would have open question and answer time with this Methodist pastor. And I had a, a particular burden upon me at that moment because there was a classmate of mine in my elementary school who had watched a, a rerun of the movie The Exorcist, which I, as a good Southern Baptist kid, was not allowed to see movies like that. But he had told me about this movie, and he had described this girl who was possessed by a demon, and I was creeped out by all of this. So I wanted to ask the Methodist pastor in the open Q&A, can a Christian indwelled by the Spirit of God be possessed by a demon, or is this something that we shouldn't worry about at all? And when I asked him that question, his response was to look really uncomfortable and frankly embarrassed. And what he said was, well, what you have to understand is that in the ancient Near Eastern world, the idea of possession was seeking to communicate alienation from self and from others. And he talked in, in this line for a long time about structures and systems and powers. And I said, yes, but can a Christian be possessed by a demon? And his response was to give another answer like that. But I kept persisting. And then finally he said, well, there are no such things as demons. And my response was to say, oh, but there are. See, right here in Mark. And I started going through the pages of Scripture. And he said, I know, but I don't think that demons actually exist. And I realized at that moment that he was embarrassed to be having this conversation because it was beside the point. What we were there to do was to be indoctrinated in a specific form of religion. And the specific form of religion that we needed was just enough Christianity to make us good Americans, but not enough Christianity to make us strange and out of step with contemporary society. They wanted not to immerse us or even to sprinkle us in the, word of the, in the world of the Bible. They wanted instead to baptize us into a cultural American form of Christianity. Now, brothers and sisters, this is perpetually a problem for us because Christian values are always more popular than a Christian gospel. And God and country Christianity will always be more acceptable than a Christ and him crucified Christianity. And nowhere has that been seen more often in the way that we have often come to this text that we have just read some moments ago. And as a matter of fact, not really to this text at all, but to one verse out of this text in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, in which... As one uh, critic put it, we find the John 3.16 of American civil religion. And yet, if you will notice, what is happening in this text confronts us with the very issues that we as the people of God are facing all around the world in this era and in every other era and not in the ways that we have often supposed. This passage and this book is written to the people of Israel after they are returning from exile. They are coming back into a land and they are coming back into a land uneasy and insecure. This book is reminding them of God's glory and God's promises in David's reign and in Solomon's reign. And in order to speak to this uneasy, insecure people, he does not, God does not point them to a bloodless civil religion. He points them to the cross. Everywhere overshadowing this text is the cross. Now, notice first of all, this is true in defining the people of God. You see, often... When we 
stand up and we hear this sort of message being preached at a 4th of July service or at some sort of a civic occasion. The, the language of if my people presupposes the country. It presupposes the civic state and the culture that goes along with the civic state. And yet this passage is defining the people of God, defining the nation of Israel by the promises of God, by the gospel. It, this is a moment where the temple is being dedicated, and the text tells us it is being dedicated in light of Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham came and, and offered up Isaac before God. It's at the in view of the threshing floor where God had appeared to David and had made the promise that there will never lack a man to sit upon your throne. Present there at the temple is the, is the Ark of the Covenant where God's, God's interaction with Moses and his covenant with Moses is represented in that, in that box, in that Ark. And through this people and from all of these promises come the Christ, who is the God over all, Romans chapter 9. Solomon stands here as the anointed mediator. He says to God, don't turn your face away from your anointed one as he prays. And he offers up sacrifice on behalf of the people, the people who are set apart and who are God's people. That is is the fundamental question that we face. When we ask the question, who are we? What is the first thing that comes to mind? If we are first and foremost identified as Americans, or if we are first and foremost identified as people who are of a certain socioeconomic class or of a certain political persuasion or of a certain cultural background. We are missing what the gospel does. It identifies and marks out a people. Second Chronicles 7 is not about getting America in step with the church. It is about getting the church out of step with America. The message here is one in which God shakes the people of God and through his mediator ministers to the people of God, reminding them who they are as people who are standing there because of promises that have been made and because of promises that are being kept. The cross is there. The cross also not only defines who the people of God are, the cross here defines the presence of God. You see, when we often come to passages like this, when we're thinking about God blessing and we're thinking about God being with the people, if we think about that in terms of some sort of God and country civil religion, then we're going to think of that in bright and shiny tones here, antiseptic tones the way that political campaigns are run. But this passage reeks of blood. Thousands of slaughtered oxen. Thousands of slaughtered sheep. The question here is about sacrifices that are being made. And the joyfulness that is coming from the people of God is because fire is coming down from heaven consuming the sacrifices, and then the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord is throughout the temple and throughout the sanctuary. The voice of God is speaking, which means that God is there. And if God is there, that means that the sacrifices are received. God is with them through blood. If my people who are called by my name, God says, humble themselves, repent of their sins, turn from their wicked ways. The radical aspect of that passage is that God says, I will hear from heaven. He says, this place 
which I have named by my name. I will be there forever. I will meet you here forever and I will hear you and I will bless you and I will respond to you. The reason that this text is so relevant to us right now is because that building doesn't stand anymore. We cannot find it. Because Jesus has said, if you tear down this temple, I will build it back up in three days. And Jesus has constructed a temple not made with hands that fulfills everything true about this temple, and he has done so through the cross, where the resurrected Christ, having offered up a sacrifice received by God, is now pulling out of all of the nations a people who are a royal priesthood, who are living stones in that temple. When we see that, and we recognize that God has promised to meet with us through that veil of bloody flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, then we will understand that we are Americans best if we are not Americans first. The state is not ultimate. The culture is not ultimate. Our circumstances are not ultimate. We have come to the temple of God. We have gathered with the global body of Christ all over the world, joining with the global body of Christ now in heaven at the heavenly Mount Zion, and we are a people who are purchased of blood. That means that we know that God will hear us. We know that God will respond to us, not because of anything that we bring, but because of the promises in which Jesus is the yes and amen. And then finally, this text shows us the cross defining what the promises of God are. He says, if my people humble themselves, if they repent, if they turn from their wicked ways. You know, often when I hear this passage talked about or preached, it's about standing against other people's sins. It's about the fact that if the country would just stop going in the direction that the country is going in, and if the country would just turn away from doing all of the things that the country is doing, then God would respond and bless the land and bless the country. And yet, God says, I will hear my people from heaven. I will heal their land. This is in the context of the promises of God. You know, what the prosperity gospel wants to do is to take the promises of God from Deuteronomy or from elsewhere in the Old Testament, and to simply take those promises, bypass Jesus, and take them directly to you. So if you as an individual are obedient to God, then God is going to bless you with health or with wealth. And then they take the curses of the Old Testament, and again, bypass the place of the skull and go directly to you. If you are disobedient to God, then God is going to give you inadequate health and inadequate resources. A prosperity gospel is no more biblical when applied to a country than when applied to a person. In both of those cases, in order to know what God is doing in blessing and cursing, we have to understand that there is no individual or nation who has obeyed the will of the Lord except for a remnant of one man. And we will be hidden in him or we will stand on our own to receive the curses of God that he has absorbed in the cross. God says that he cares about his people even in their exile, even in their uneasiness after exile, and he gives them in this a warning he says, if you are disobedient, then I'm going to tear this temple down. 
I'm going to tear my people down and everybody passing by will say, God has abandoned them because of their disobedience. Brothers and sisters, this is exactly what happened when the Israel of God, when the temple of God, when the man of God bears upon himself the curses for the people of God, and those who are passing by and see him there drowning in the wrath of God say, he said that he was the king of Israel, and yet he cannot come down from that cross. Even in the warning that God gives here, we should rejoice in God's goodness to us. You know, there are many Christians that when they look at the culture around them right now, they're fearful, they're afraid, they're outraged. And the reason often that we become so fearful is because we're comparing the culture that we have around us right now to some imagined culture that we used to have in the 1950s or the 1980s or at the founding era or at some other point. What the gospel says to us is that we have nothing to be afraid of because if we have the promises of God, then the worst thing that can possibly happen to us has already happened. Crucifixion under the wrath of God. And the best thing that can possibly happen to us has happened to us. We're raised from the dead and we're seated at the right hand of the Father. We have received an inheritance that we're joint heirs of. The right man is at the helm of the universe and God's promises are true where we meet with him in the person of Jesus Christ. And if that is the case then whatever is happening in the mission field around us, whatever is happening in the culture around us, however uneasy we may feel in the world around us, we are marching joyfully and triumphantly to Zion, which means that our response shouldn't be fearfulness of the outside and it shouldn't be anger at the outside. It should be humbling ourselves as a church repenting together as a church, crying out in prayer together as a church, which means that we know that we are going to be healed and that the blessing that God has for us is not a blessing that comes necessarily through material flourishing. It is a blessing that comes with an advance of the gospel as the gospel goes throughout the world means if we get back to the gospel, then we're going to crucify our civil religions. We're going to crucify our discount rate prosperity gospels. We're going to get rid of that gentle lowing of golden calves that we so often have around us and realize that we do not serve the generic God of American values. We serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of David, the God of Jesus of Nazareth. And he has told us who we are, and he has told us where to find him. He has given us covenant promises and shown us those covenant promises, not just in a voice, but in a person. And he's promised to us short term a cross on our backs, and he's promised us long-term a crown of life, imperishable. The culture around us may think that is strange, may think that is freakish, may think that is subversive, but we nonetheless humble ourselves, repent, pray, seek, and we recognize that God never promised us a God and country package. Would you pray for me?